My guest is Lance James, Chief Scientist of Flashpoint. Welcome, Lance. Hey, thank you. So what got you into uh, the whole threat intelligence space? Well, uh, humbly speaking, I think I accidentally invented some of it. Uh, but I was uh, doing, in 2002, 2003, I was doing a... Uh, tracking bad guys uh, through like spam. I was actually watching spam classification and we were tracking actually um, uh, bad guys that were using spam to actually send covert messages. Uh, and so what happened was phishing came out and like when it started hitting the banks in 2003 and we used the same techniques in this group I was working with. And so let's go after this and then the next thing you know, uh, we started tracking it down. So it kind of started in forensics and then basically online forensics and digital forensics. And then basically the next thing you know, we. Uh, uh, kind of, um, I started a company out of that back in 2003 that focused on tracking fishers and bad guys and attribution and kind of hacking the hackers in a, in a good way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and basically, I, I called it counterintelligence back then, basically. Uh, it was before the word cyber was a popular thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, it was just kind of taking the cyberspace domain and we were applying counterintelligence and infosec. Uh, focusing on going after the hackers. So in my head, I wasn't thinking about it being called threat intelligence, which it is today. Um, but it was just something uh, that along the road, it was that's what uh, what people uh, what I was doing back then. People start now start calling threat intelligence. So, um, but uh, yeah, so it so just, you just kind of fell into my lap. And you <laughs> sold that firm. Yeah, I sold that mm. firm, and then basically I moved on to uh, Dumbala for a little bit, uh, and then I went to Vigilant, and then mm -hmm. we sold that firm to Deloitte, uh, and now I'm here at uh, Flashpoint. Uh, having some fun uh, in the deep dark web. Yeah, I bet. So uh, give us the you know the one two three on Flashpoint. It's the Google of the deep dark web, right? Okay. But yeah. Google's been taken. Now, um, <laughs> so basically, it's 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 really neat. It's actually I, I joined because I was on the advisory board, uh, and then I saw what they were doing, and I was like, the way that they were handling traditional intelligence meets cyber um, today um, was just phenomenal and the way they're collecting the information in the portal and making it manageable for uh, intelligence teams to, 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 to make take action on actual deep and dark web. I thought it was good because it was preemptive. A lot of people talk about proactive threat intelligence, but most of the time your IOCs are compromised after, you've, after the fact. In this case, we're watching the planners, we're watching, we see the TTPs before they actually uh, you know, make a move, right? So if we're seeing something like, you know, pin and chip is moving and getting hot, we're seeing what the bad guys are doing about planning and like trying to, to, to deal with those problems. So this allows us to kind of get ahead of the threat. Uh, so I wanted to become uh, involved in a company that was actually really kind of, they set the, the threat intelligence model up correctly, both as a service and a product. And I thought that was actually really neat, so. And don't they have uh, some uh, terrorist intelligence? They started out actually in counterterrorism, which I really kind of like, I binded with because my first work was in uh, counterterrorism as well. And so um, uh, that kind of was interesting because when you do counterterrorist work, the, the process of doing that and taking it to cyber pretty much is a similar concept of taking counterintelligence and putting it into what they now should be calling CCI or cyber counterintelligence, which is what people want to call threat intelligence, mm -hmm. right? So I... Um, their, their actual, their, um, their understanding of, like one of the, the great things about Flashpoint is we support 12 or 13 languages, uh, Arabic, Farsi, Span you know, Spanish, so we can hit the globe with a lot of things, but uh, uh, their understanding of insurgencies and ISIS and, and jihad uh, is, is uh, impeccable, and I'm learning a lot while I'm there as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, uh, you know, coming in there as a, an SME or a subject matter expert and, you know, schooling everybody else. I'm learning so much from culturally uh, about different countries and like uh, the reasons why these factions start, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, coming out of the woodwork and, uh, you know, and, and, and the cool thing is it's kind of like a constant, we're all kind of like learning from each other and providing support. So it's, it's really neat. It's fun. How does uh, Flashpoint differentiate itself from the, I think I track about 45 vendors that, that either provide threat feeds of some sort or they do something with the threat feeds? Well, one of the things we don't do is pretty much, we don't really focus so much on the threat feed aspect of it. I mean, we do definitely have an API that supports you creating threat feeds and uh, or change, you know, alerting on things. But really we focus on precision information, which is we don't collect all this data. We don't, like, we're not going to be the, uh, you know, collecting everything in the in the deep dark web. We're going to focus on what's actually important and pertinent, right? Uh, a lot of people talk about big data, and I say think smart data. So, you know, um, we are not focused on volume, right? We're focused on one. What's very different from us is we have people on the ground. Kind of when I say on the ground, they're in cyber ground, but basically they're in there talking to the bad guys. 
uh, focusing on like understanding what the, the big impacts are, and then basically working with a development team to basically make sure that that is uh, searchable and attributable to, to and, and, and applicable to the, uh, the, the, our clients, basically, on, the, on their ground, right? So the difference here is, uh, in one way, is that I've never, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about threat intelligence, and threat feeds to me is not threat intelligence, it's information. Um, and until it has analysis, it's, it doesn't become intelligence. And so this is pre-analyzed information. It's human vetted and then basically machine uh, ready, you know what I mean? Which then goes back to the human on the other side, right? So when you think about it, intelligence will never take away the human, right? And, and as much as I see people trying to automate and threat intelligence and all this, um, it's, it's done with a really good balance of where the humans play and, and make it actual human intelligence or SIG intelligence, signal intelligence, or, and then it basically pushes into something that is usable but for, for human, but it's basically a focus around mostly the human aspect of taking action. So, so inside the intelligence circle, you've got collections, yes. analysis, Collection uh, distribution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're, if you bring on a new customer, that's only you know, so that's when the tasking is started, and then you start collecting. Right. So we actually do things. So basically, we have what's like called prioritization intelligence requirements, right, or prioritized intelligence requirements. So before, when we bring on a new customer, um, we focus on what are your areas of concern. Where are you going to do? Give us a rating of like, are you worried about jihadists, hacktivists, cybercrime, nation states, things like this. And so we actually prioritize uh, in a high touch way. And that's one thing I think was missing out with threat intelligence or intelligence in general. Intelligence is all about your network and your communication to each other. We talk about the feedback at the end of the you know dissemination and then there's a feedback. If you don't have that feedback mode, you can't fine tune. Good example in general sense, if there wasn't a feedback mode on counterterrorism in general for the government, we wouldn't know how to do better or lessen the, the, the risks, right? So each time it's reviewed. So the same with our customers and our clients is we have kind of a feedback m mechanism that goes back into then our requirements again, which is our PIR, right? This prioritized intelligence requirement. And so this basically goes in circles, but we have high touch communication with our client. We don't, you know, and, and we figured out a way to scale that. And then also with our portal, it, it basically, it, it makes it really easy because what they ask for, like the questions they ask in their uh, request for information is already, most, a lot of the answers are in our portal. And then it's only like, hey, we just need a little bit of this or that. So we can actually scale it nicely. Yeah. Um, does the, you know, does the, where do you think the industry as a whole is going to go? Because right now it's kind of in a, a state of disarray. There's so it's hard to differentiate who who provides what value. Everybody's buying dozens of threat feeds. Right, or they're buying each other. Or they're buying each other's. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's gonna it's gonna mellow out. I think the way I've seen it is this. I feel like we're in a cyber bubble. If I may be honest, um, it, it's it's kind of like this thing where. I, I think what's missing is the operationalization of, uh, like the CISOs and downward are missing a, a how to operationalize, you know, half of these threat feeds. It's either overwhelming to their SIM, it's either, you know, not providing enough, there's too much overlap, and there's no, like, market for controlling this, or there's no, like, Yelp review or crowdsourced, like, way of saying these, these type of threat feeds work for this or this, or there's no way to say, hey, this type of uh, feed should go to my McAfee proxy or, you know, my FireEye device, or it doesn't really have a route to it, right? So um, that's the big gap. So when you think about that, I believe that the industry, the actual people that are on the ground trying to work IT security, engineering, and operations, I think there's either going to be a large demand for that to happen soon, which will then weed out because they'll be able to do bake-offs, overlap testing, things like this. And, and if you want to do analytics, it isn't about analytics for... Um, you know, inside and outside, it's what was used and what am I getting, gaining out of my, uh, my uh, threat intelligence or threat feeds because after a while, you can't buy every threat feed, it's just too costly. And I think that over time, um, you know, uh, there's going to be kind of a, a plateau out and we're going we're gonna to see, I think it's going to take about another year, year and a half, but I think that uh, given the M&As that are going on in the mergers anyways, I think that uh, I've already seen that there's a lot less now. There's just now some core players. Um, mm -hmm. And so it really depends on what you're doing, right? So, like, you have companies that are more like analyst workbenches. You have threat feeds specifically for APTs or cybercrime, things like that. Uh, you have your OSINT feeds that are already available. Um, and I think, honestly, it's just a matter of getting people to, now that uh, people understand what threat intelligence is and the value it's supposed to be, I think the demand or the demand on the, the quality from the, the, from the, the vendors is going to be pushing hard. 
uh, I think people are going to make harder decisions before they buy to, to really put the, to, to, to up the demand and the competitive nature of the actual content itself. Where would an organization's maturity level be before they're probably ready to start ingesting threat feeds? Well, I've always said, if you're not, if you can't do it, you know, when you think about your business continuity plan or your defense uh, disaster recovery, if you can't, if you're not ready for IR, if you're not ready to actually react to the, to the actual uh, indicators that are coming in, uh, I think the maturity uh, level has to be that they've already established and understand their own network first and can find anomalies in their own network without uh, external information, right, or, or external intelligence. Once they get to that point, I think they're going to be better off because then they understand exactly what to do and the cost of what, why they need to buy, right? Like, what is the total cost of ownership of a threat intelligence program for them, right? Because then they've also measured the metrics of what is a risk to us, what the value of those risks, what kind of, like, they're gonna break down the threat model and they're gonna say, hey, what kind of risk do we deal with? And they'll know exactly what their, um, their structure is for uh, taking in threat intelligence. Um, so in my opinion, I think that uh, when you deal with threat intelligence, if you're not ready to take in the information or the digestion of the information, uh, then I would like you know step back and, and understand your network first, and then from there. So I think it's that kind of maturity that's required. Um, the good news is that um, from the financial side, like if you look at just the financial, the big banks, they are at that point of maturity. Um, also with the sharing programs, the ISACs out there and stuff like that, they're they're at that level of supporting that maturity. Um, so, you know, people talk about taxi and sticks, uh, whether it's got a ways to go or not, um, that is a level of maturity that is, like, I'd say, really mature. Um, you know, getting it in your sim and actually prioritizing it, I'd say that's like, you know, at the bottom of the high maturity rate, uh, but it's a good start. Uh, anything below that, I think it's, you, you should spend time, the like, next three, six months, really knowing your own network first and, and figuring out what your DNS doing, what is your uh, what is uh, what is your web proxy doing? Like all of the things, and then managing that, making sure you have that managed, so then you can basically know exactly where you need your threat intelligence inputs coming in and outputs. So I know a few organizations that have taken on the the threat gathering, threat intelligence gathering themselves. Mm -hmm. What's your advice to them when they're looking at that stage? It's good to get people like looking into the IRC monitoring and the and the and learning about the actors and what they do. But the biggest uh, hurdle is is making sure your opsec for your company is set up right. If you just have someone just doing that, uh, and it's coming out of a, a big bank's IP address, it's, it could endanger the bank. Um, so basically, if it's something like that or a project like that, it's something that definitely should be planned out, discussed, and and you know considered. But it's really understanding the benefits of it, right? Whereas uh, you know a big financial firm might not be set up for that, and it's not in their best interest to take those actions. So. Yeah, and I, I can see somebody who's been attacked by an, an anonymous group, right. you know, infiltrating their public open forums and getting in a lot of trouble and just making the matters worse. Right. It's, escalation is a big issue, right? So uh, let's even take the days of the Syrian Electronic Army when there, this, some of this is psychological warfare and going on and it's involved in Middle Eastern conflicts, things like this. Um, you just, you know, tampering or messing with that without understanding the bigger picture on this can be very, very dangerous for your corporation and yourself. Some of these people, I mean, their biggest talent is doxing and finding out who you are. Doxing being the concept of taking your information and publishing it online. And then once that happens, you're, 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 you're you don't really have control of it anymore, uh, and it can be really bad for a very long time. So it, these people, you know, as much as they seem like kitties or this or that, these these uh, these people aren't a joke, and they're volatile and can be very dangerous. So. So leave it to the pros. Leave it to the pros. Yeah. Yeah. So. So what's next for Flashpoint? Um, well, we're coming out with a new beta portal, uh, one portal to rule them all since mm -hmm. we've had a multiple uh, different uh, database types that we've had and uh, data types. Um, so we're kind of bringing all that in. Uh, better user experience design for that. Uh, um, more, um, uh, we're adding a lot of cool features. Uh, it, it, we're adding an, uh, kind of like an active filter where you can create searching and, and API alerting so you can um, kind of basically um, uh, create your own rule sets that are going to basically also tagging and annotations for as an analyst is going to be some, something that's going to come out that's going to be a little bit out there but uh, uh, we're really happy about to, to see that so we're really kind of looking at more like how do we enable the analyst uh, how do they use our tools more um, you know and we've been really kind of sitting down with our clients and saying what can we you know what are you guys needing from us so it's it's built around our clients uh, as well as professionals in the uh, intelligence industry. So we're Got really it. happy about that. Got it. So. Thanks for coming. Hey, thank you.